is there any word about uh, prayer day here? At oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, and actually, if this goes out on Zoom, that's okay because anyone within hearing, and I was just in a Zoom meeting for it this morning. Thank you. <laughs> day of prayer, Thursday, May 4th. San Bernardino is a city that honors that, that respects it, and on the grass area of our city hall where we've been for, oh my goodness, years and years, thanks to Pastor Alan Rosenberg, the mantle passed to Pastor Dan of the Rock. We are meeting again at the noon hour. It's, it's very much trying to stay within an hour format. Um, they have different you know, pastors from different communities that, that will be speaking very shortly and on the sections that they're given to speak on. Um, I have been given the blessing of being uh, brought on to give the ironic blessing over it in the beginning. So, um, but I want to encourage you, I asked for flyers. For those of you who don't deal with social media and you want to be able to give out flyers, I should have some very soon. Um, but they are, <coughs> excuse me, they, uh, welcome. You putting it out on any kind of social media, May 4th, City Hall, grassy area, noon hour, day of prayer. Uh, we Is fully believe 12? it can make our city change. 12? 12 o'clock noon, yes. Yes. So, um, and anyone who want to come in person and support, please do. You know, even to show our city that we've got people that are willing to stop, step out of normal routine, come together and openly and publicly pray. It's our given right in this country and we should use it and not, not allow it to fall by the wayside. So uh, I encourage each and every one, um, if you cannot make it in person, please spend that hour in prayer. But if you can make it in person, please, it is a double, double bonus to be praying together and showing our community. Uh, we want to make some changes here. And uh, I guarantee you it's not going to happen short of prayer. Absolutely guarantee you that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for reminding me. I will try to keep announcing that, but it's going to be here rapidly, especially without class. We don't have class next week. I think we'll have, yeah, it'll be the day just before. So May 3rd will be our next class. I can't believe, where does this year go? And mm -hmm. the very next day. So I will not have time to hand out flyers to you at that class. So if I need to get them to you also, please let me know. Um, or I can direct you to another pickup spot for, for a handheld flyers to, to pass out also. Um, but we spent time in prayer for our day of prayer already. Please do that too. So, okay, now with all that commercial out of the way, um, but not commercial <laughs> and critical. <laughs> um, I failed to ask, last week Loretta gave us a map, showed us a map with Ammon and Moab, the areas that I mentioned, where they were in biblical times with Israel. Uh, how many would like that emailed to them? Okay, Rhonda, Dor doesn't want email, you want it in person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm not getting a whole lot there. Maybe I'll just send it out. I think I'll just do that. I'll send it in an attachment like I do the cross-references. If you don't want it, you just don't have to open it up. <laughs> okay, but that way anyone who wants it gets it. Those who need it, hand, hand it to them or snail mail. Make sure if you don't get it very shortly, I've overlooked you by accident. Let me know so that I can get it to you. Um, it's a good, simple map. There's nothing, um, you know, if you've got good maps, it's nothing different than yours. But if you don't have access to then it's a good reference. Okay, now I think I'm ready. So, do I just go? Just give a short pause and go ahead. Okay, I'm told to pause shortly, so. Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, April 19th. We are picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 20, verse 14 about. We talked a little bit, but I'll still return us to that to complete our thought there, and then we'll move into chapter 21. So we've just come through the time where Abraham, our man of faith, really slipped and did not show his faith. Instead, acting out of fear, told Sarah, his wife, once again, to be his sister only. He, she was his half-sister, but a half-lie. Told to hide the truth is a whole lie. So uh, he was called up short about it. Um, Avimelech, Abimelech, 
had taken her into his harem. It could have been in his mind like a political marriage to keep uh, peace with Avraham because he was a very blessed man, had great wealth and, and servants and you know multitude of, of what could come against this, um, this man in his, quote, kingdom, his area, uh, Gerard. And so it's very likely that, excuse me, was his intent was just to make that political overture. But God kept him from touching Sarah. He was not a God, a, a man who knew the one true and living God. He probably worshipped heathen gods, but that does not stop God short. As he says in Proverbs 21, 1, he's able to move through the kings, through their minds. He came to Avimelech in a dream, said, you're a dead man. Got his attention right away and was warned if he touched Sarah, he would be dead, that God would take life from him. He obviously, it was not his intent. He had a respect for God, even though he didn't know him in a personal way. And in fact, we see such a contrast to the Pharaoh in Egypt when Moshe came forward, spoke to him about the true and living God. You see no crack in Pharaoh toward respect of the one true and living God, but you see everything in Abimelech in that way. He apparently had a moral conscience. He knew right from wrong. And he was open to receive that divine revelation, and it did spare him his life. So he calls Abraham up short. He publicly, he took, he, because it wasn't just going to be Abimelech, it was going to be his household also that would, would be dead. And so he called them all together. He warned them of the consequences of what could have happened and just about did. And, of course, it shook all of them to the core also. Then he calls Abraham in, and, and he, he rebukes them, you know, what? Why did you do this to me? Why didn't you speak the truth to me? And Abraham brought out, well, I was afraid that, that you wouldn't respect God, that there was no fear of God here. Truth be known, it was that Abraham didn't have the fear that he should have. He, he walked in his own fear instead of the fear of God, who God is, to protect him. We know that this was a repeat. Sometimes we have to learn our lessons again and again until we really learn them. What encourages me is this is not what marks Abraham in God's mind. He calls him a righteous man. He calls him a man of faith. He uses him as an example in our chapter of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So not to give us a right to make mistakes, but to keep us from when we have made a mistake, allowing Satan to sow in the doubt that now you're useless, worthless to God, he's so disappointed in you, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to feed those comments any further. But uh, Avimelech um, was told in that dream also to, because Abraham is a prophet, one who forth tells, uh, not necessarily foretells, but at least forth tells about God, this F-O-R-T-H, if you're not hearing it well in the video, that uh, to go to him and ask him to pray for you that you not only don't die, but that you be blessed. And that's what we're going to see happen. So he's called him up short. He's told him what you've done to me, you shouldn't have done. Um, and then in verse 14, I think is where it starts saying, um, that we get past Auburn's excuse. Yes, okay, verse 14 starts with what Abimelech gives to Abraham. He's going to give him blessing because he's coming to him asking him for blessing also. So he gives him, according to verse 14, he took sheep and oxen, male and female servants, gave them to Abraham, and returned his wife Sarah to him. That's the most important part is the returning of the wife. These gifts were, were more of just making amends, even though it's Avraham's fault. Abimelech is still, he's wanting to make amends, make overtures, and there may be another reason for um, the, the uh, animals, the, the sheep and the oxen. I'll tell you that in a moment. Uh, as we come to in the scripture, we'll get just a little bit more. So verse 15 says, Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. Keep this in mind. Remember, Abraham came to that area because of a need, and he is being told, you, you can live here. You can live wherever you want. Pick the place that you want. So he's being given favor in that way. Apparently, he takes him up on it because we don't hear that he moves out of the area, and later it seems to reference that. 
Verse 16 says to Sarah, okay, so Avimelech now turns to her and says, look, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is your vindication before all who are with you and before everyone you are cleared. Now, this can be looked at in two different ways in this verse. One, it can be that she's being reproved for being an accomplice, that she did also hide the fact that she was Abraham's wife, that she didn't speak up. Um, and what Abimelech is saying is, don't be afraid to say he's your husband. That will keep others from luring after you, from seeing you, and from wanting you, and acting out in a way toward you that they should not that he will be your covering. Um, also the idea that Abraham being a prophet, that even, he's a man of God, that should also be your veil of protection that should keep other eyes from looking toward you. Now when we get into a little more of the Hebrew background, we do see in this that when it says that, that he gave a thousand shekels and it's a covering of the eyes, this is a, like a propitiation. It, it was something that would be done to appease a deity. It's not that he's saying that he knows who this true God is, but he is recognizing this one as a God. And so he is wanting to make amends that show his heart, his intent, is only to do right. So he's giving a gift that is going to bless Sarah and more than just she, because if she were a mistress, her, the whole family suffers the consequences of that also. If she's disgraced in her role, it, it's, it's a reflection on the family. So others would be disgraced along with her. But showing that she was justified, showing that she nothing had been done to her, and I'll show you how that comes out in this, would, would save her face and her position, her grace, whatever I should call it, for all the family also. You know, she was not, wrong was not done to her. She's not a marked woman, so to speak now. Um, the thousand shekels was a present made to Sarah. It was showing how, how greatly she was valued. Later we learn a bit more of that value system. When we get into Shemot, in Exodus chapter 21 and 32, we find the value of a slave is 30 shekels that if one needed to pay for a slave for you know, whatever reason, according to law, they were to pay 30 shekels. Now some said she was, Sarah was to take the thousand shekels, she was to go buy a veil and wear this veil, a covering that she didn't have on. But from the Hebrew, I don't believe that's what's being said at all. It was saying that this gift, so great a value, shows you're worth more than a slave, shows you're respected as a person, shows you're being respected as a prophet's wife, and in the fact that you were not disgraced, you are able to receive this gift and this blessing because nothing wrong was done to you. So it is a covering for you in that sense. In essence, a Hebrew can be literally you are judged, or in that adjudication, you've been judged free. You've been judged that, that you were not dishonored. Nothing wrong did or inappropriate did happen to you, and you are, in a sense, cleared. The Hebrew word is yachach. And again, it's to make that decision to prove or not prove. It's like when you do go before the judge. Are you going to be exonerated or are you going to be declared guilty? And this gift of the thousand shekels shows she is a person to be honored. Nothing's been done to disgrace her. She is clear. No one should be able to say anything later. And I think that's the critical reason behind this. Because remember, she's going to be the mother who brings forth that seed that leads to Messiah, Mashiach. And God is closing every door. He is not leaving anything open to scuttlebutt, to bad mouths, to, you know, there's nothing that people are going to be able to whisper. You know, none of that. God's just saying, boom, 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 everywhere you look. Uh, Avimelech is making clear, I didn't touch her. The household knows clearly she wasn't touched. Coming back into Abraham's realm, she's coming in with grace. She's coming in with respect. She's coming in with dignity. Nothing has been there to harm who she is 
or to harm or question her reputation. So I think really fully that's why we're spelled out these details, why it's so much money. And then we're going to see also still another point with the, the animals. I don't believe I missed it yet. I think it's still coming in my notes. So if it doesn't come, I'll, I'll backtrack and tell you. But I think it's I think it's got to be coming up. It is coming up. I know where it's coming. So <laughs> let me just move forward. Sorry, my mind, uh, sometimes I get wrapped around my own, you know, my eye tooth and I can't see where I'm going. So, they and they've been given the land, the silver, she's been vindicated, everyone's clear. Okay, verse 17, key. Then Abraham prayed to God. Remember God told Ali Melech, go to Abraham that he might pray for you. So he did go, he did do things right. Abraham is now praying to God. And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his female slaves so that they gave birth to children. Now that word healed tells us that apparently there was some sort of a, a plague, a disease, something that kept all of them from being able to, to have children. Their, their wounds were shut up. It does not mean that a long period of time had elapsed and they figured it out, huh, we're not having any more kids here. But in some way, it was evident that the whole household, the whole uh, Abimelech and all his that belonged to him were under some sort of a judgment here that, that was keeping them from being able to have children. Remember, they weren't, he wasn't to touch Sarah's womb. The others were also suffering the consequence just like it was said, you know, when, 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 uh, uh, when God warned Abimelech, if you don't turn at this heat, you and your family will suffer. So the whole family is involved in this also. A little hard for me to put that into words, but I hope I'm making it clear and that you understand. Um, what we're seeing is that in spite of Abraham's weakness, it's exalted that, I shouldn't say it, God is exalted. He is so compassionate. He is so full of grace. And he is so full of mercy that even a heathen king, who happened to be right in this instant, was still compelled to bow before Abraham, to go to Abraham and ask him, please pray to your God, to be in that intercessory role for him, to remove this divine punishment from his household. And in this, God's going to prove his control over the heathen kingdoms over the Philistine kings or, or you know um, rulers that will come down down the line and we see that he does not allow harm to come to his prophets that's in line with Psalm Tehillim 105 and verse 15 and let me read that for you you can look it up with me if you want Psalm 105 verse 15 God is faithful. He, no matter what man does or doesn't do, God is the faithful one. Verse 15, he says, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Speaking that, we see God telling Abimelech that Abimelech turning at that reproof from God, and he did suffer no harm. That shows how God can contain or it can um, not contain, but he, his covenant promises are not going to be broken because somebody who doesn't believe in God does their own thing. God is still in control. He saw to it that Sarah's womb was not touched. There was no compromise. There was no chance to think that it, it even could have been so that there would be no question when the fulfillment of promise comes and she is, uh, finds herself with child. This should have behooved Israel for all of her future enemies. No matter who was surrounding her, no matter who she was facing, look at the power of her God to protect her and to keep his word faithful to her. And I want to say to my beloved Israel today, you're in the midst of a very trying time. You have war coming at you imminently. I'll just put it that way. None of us know the... the exact date that we know the threat that is there she has many countries surrounding her that want to wipe her off the face of this map she could stand in fear she is so little against such large an enemy but the same way that God took care of Abraham against this one heathen God is still standing with Israel in spite of her rebelliousness because God is faithful 
Is she going to be punished for her, her rebelliousness? Of course, like any rebellious child deserves and needs to stand corrected. But God's never going to say, I'm going to let go and come what may will happen to you. He's never going to let there be a full end to Israel because he promised that. He said, I may make a full end of other nations, but I never will of Israel. It is God's faithfulness. And if our people would look and see how God is their protection, she's standing against all odds. That's not because she's so great or she's so good. It's because her God is so great and so good. And if she would just realize that and cry out again, like they did back in the time before the Exodus, when God heard their moans and their groans and could send in the Redeemer. There is an intercessor standing on behalf of Israel right now. We know that's her Messiah. And oh, how we just pray that the eyes be open at this difficult time to see the truth of his protection, of his perfect plan, and to turn to him for salvation now while it's yet day. Rowena? Yes. She's trying to unmute. Okay. Okay. Roger's trying to. Okay. okay. Yeah. Every time you say that Israel is so small and there's so many giants around her, I have that picture that God purposely works on the small ones. Amen. So that he is magnified. Amen. And Israel is always like a picture of David fighting Goliath. Yes. Always that way. Yes. From decades and decades and decades. Yes. And I believe it's Deuteronomy 7. If not, it's right around that chapter where God says exactly that, Rowena. I picked you, Israel, because you're the rent, because you're the least, because my glory will show. And it's not just for the Jewish people. It's to use them as an example to the world. That's what Israel was to do, was to re represent her God to the world so that they might know. And yes, absolutely, it is little David up against big Goliath. And he came down with one rock. He, he got rocked to sleep <laughs> because of the rock of our salvation. That's the rock that took him down. <laughs> so yes, fully agree. And, and just, you know, pray in your heart even now for Israel's salvation. Um, coming back into this, uh, back in chapter 20, Abraham prayed and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female slaves. So they gave birth to children. They, again, the wombs were open. They were able to give birth. And it tells us in verse 18, that was not something that just happened it happened because the Lord had completely closed all the wombs of the household of Avimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So for her own sake, all of them suffered the consequences. God, you know, he didn't say, well, it's only one person. No, no. And with God on your side, oh my goodness. I'm looking for what I wanted, and I'm not seeing it. Let me bring it out now, and I'm sure there's going to be a point where we... Um, talk about it, but the, the idea was given that Abraham and Avimelech had a covenant uh, after this point, and the animals that were given may have been the animals that were used in that cutting of the covenant, because it reminds us of chapter 15, when God cut covenant with Abraham. And so I, I'll just drop that seed in when I find in my notes um, where it why it gets triggered from scripture, I'll give that to you because I'm not seeing it at this point, but I'm sure it's coming because I remember studying it. <laughs> so anyway, I apologize for that, but just want to complete our thoughts here. It may not have been in totality, but um, it could be likely that the, the animals given were used in that way. I may be remembering something a little wrong. Uh, somebody calling me? Yeah, Rhonda. Rhonda, go ahead. Why um, the Lord closed all the wounds of the house of Albemarle because of Sarah? I'm not understanding that. Well, we don't understand why God chose to do it in that way. We're just told God did, that the wombs were not closed because uh, of a disease that went through, that they could say, well, you know, this was from human, you know, they have contact with this and it caused it or, you know, whatever. It was to show that it was the divine hand of God that he was protecting not only Sarah's womb, but he wasn't allowing the blessing 
of any womb being open during that time. We know that, that God is the one that does open the womb and closes the womb, and he was showing his power, and that the consequences don't just fall on the, the one. He was head of the household, so the consequences falling on Abimelech fell on all of them. And because Abimelech was not to touch the womb of Sarah, these other wombs were also closed up. That's the best I can get to it, because other than that, I think we have to ask the Lord himself. But does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And it's, it's a good question, but we do see that even in today, we can see that something will happen, and it, it, the consequences fall on more than those who deserve it. You know, you, you see a, a car accident by someone who is being chased by the police because they've done wrong, and yet the innocent suffer the consequences. We're not, uh, I'm not saying that, that it's the unfair hand of God. That's an unfair circumstance I just gave, so maybe it's not a good example. But the idea behind it, again, is in this world, we do see consequences that fall on more than just the, initi the, the, the initiator, the cause, the person. Um, so in this case, uh, what happened to the head of the household happened to all of the household. Uh, and we often, we often see that, even in, to the point of salvation also, especially as we move into the Brita Chadashah, into the New Covenant, uh, the scripture that says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. That's a hard verse for people to understand because we know individually each one has to receive Yeshua Jesus for salvation. But the way the households went in that day, as the, the patriarch of the family went, so went the family. So if he brought Christianity in, if he brought the belief in of having to believe in, in Yeshua Jesus for salvation, that was given to his whole family, and they moved as a group. So they, they would all come in. They wouldn't fight it individually, but they would agree to it. And in essence, then each individually is asking for their personal salvation. So we see the blessing that the whole household was saved. Um, it's just a little different concept than we who are taught to think very individually think. Uh, maybe those who have been in military and are taught that group think understand it even a bit more. But uh, I just, I kind of can relate the two. So I hope that helps. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then we will move into chapter 21, as I promised. Um, and more importantly, we're going to see what God promises. So we start off with then the Lord, and I'll stop you right there and tell you that word in our Hebrew is Jehovah. That's our covenant-keeping God. That's the name that's used here. Remember, different names are used at different times for different reasons. So here we have that reassurance again that even though Abraham has slipped, he has not caused the loss of the covenant that God made with him because God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham. So the covenant-keeping God took note of Sarah as he had said. We know that he told Sarah she was going to have a baby. And it says the Lord did for Sarah as he promised. So, and by the way, if you have the King James, you have the word that the Lord visited. The Hebrew sense is that, that the Lord's coming into uh, the, the circumstances of this person's life. And it will be either for a blessing or for a judgment. In this case, hallelujah, it's the blessing. It's been a long time. It took 25 years for this promise to come to pass. That God, who is faithful, keeps his promises. And his timing is perfect. It's not our time. It's not how we see and understand. We know it was a long testing of their faith, but we're going to see that it was proved true and they received the beautiful benefits of that promise. So it was, uh, as the end of the verse said, as he had promised, as God had spoken. Again, we're seeing the faithfulness of God to his word. It's not going to be that the promise is fulfilled because Abraham is perfect. We just saw he's not. And we're not going to see that it's because he merited it. He earned it. No, at this point, this would be a low point, and he'd have a demerit rather than a merit. So it's not that. But it's simply God being faithful to his word. The unconditional promise of the faithful God. So, what happened in because of that promise? Verse 2. So, Sarah conceived. Now, 
stop right there and realize. Don't just run past that. That's miracle right there. You've got a 90-year-old woman, you've got a 100-year-old man, or actually nine months short of that, but, you know, <laughs> very close to that. We know that they were both as good as dead when it comes to rejuvenation, when it comes to uh, being able to reproduce. That was made very clear to us. But both of their bodies are rejuvenated. This is not immaculate conception. This is not when the, the Ruch Kodesh Holy Spirit came on Miriam and she conceived. No, the, Abraham is the father. Sarah is the mother. But you've got two bodies that shouldn't have been able to reproduce coming together and reproducing. And it is miraculous. Now we know Abraham goes on, God so rejuvenated him, he's going to have six more sons when he marries Keturah after Sarah's death. So when God starts, it doesn't stop. <laughs> but uh, for Sarah, we, we only, you know, she only had Yitzhak, Isaac. I just gave it away. But you know the story. And it tells us that Sarah conceived and bore a son. No guess what they were going to have. To Abraham in his old age. By the way, it's chapter 17 and verse 17 and chapter 21 and verse 5 that let us know he was 100 years old when Yitzhak is born. But notice when he was born, at the appointed time. That tells me that even Abraham's little slip-up didn't cost time, didn't get out of God's plan, it caused God to come up with plan B. No, God had planned the time. It wasn't 25 years later because it took God 25 years to make it happen. It's because God delayed it for that amount of time because this is his perfect timing. Our Hebrew says that it was a, the appointed season. Now, if you go back to chapter 18 and verse 14, you're going to see that word used there also. Let's take a sneak peek back there. Genesis 18 and verse 14. And in Genesis 18, 14, we read, Is anything too difficult for the Lord. At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So God said it's going to happen. We know the time passed, then God came and said it's, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen next year at this appointed time, at this season, that she's going to, in essence, conceive, and then she will bear a son. It's, in the Hebrew, the season is meaning the time of life. And it might mean spring. I'm not telling you this is fact, but spring is the revival of life. Mm -hmm. And it may be that Yitzhak's birth, Isaac's birth, because it's going to be a picture of death, uh, I'm sorry, resurrection out of death, life coming out of death. It might be that he was born in the springtime to be a type, a picture of that resurrection life. We even see it in our own nature. You see everything look like it dies off in winter. The tree branches lose their leaves. They look like dead trees. And then spring comes and you start seeing the life. And we talk about, oh, it's springing to life. So it might be in that, um, that it was springtime. I cannot tell you exactly. We can ask one day when we're in, hope, in heaven when, when he was born. But what I can tell you is it was the perfect timing. God talks about seasons and time all the way back from creation. We looked at it heavily back in those early chapters in Bereshit in Genesis. And we know that God has a cycle, a season, a time, a purpose is all appointed according to his means. So in the perfect timing, and as my mom used to say, God's seldom early and he's never late. He is always on time. So in that perfect timing, I've got to go back to chapter 21. I'm trying to read in 18 now. Sorry. There we go. Okay. At the point in time at which God had spoken to him, verse, oh, well, let's see, and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the point in time at which God had spoken to him. So, verse 3, Abraham named his son who was born to him, the son whom Sarah bore to him. Notice the emphasis. It's, we know the father, we know the mother. There's no question. This is the one that God miraculously enabled them to bear the son, and he was called Isaac in our English, Yitzhak in our Hebrew, and it means laughter. Now, technically, Abraham didn't name his son. 
He is the one who declares it here. It would be if we were writing out the birth certificate, the father would be the one in, in Hebrew heritage to declare the name of the child. You even see that carried out when Yochanan, John the Baptist, was going to be born and his father had been um, silenced, couldn't speak until the birth. <clears throat> And when the, the wife said, you know, his name was to be John, and there was no one in the family with that name, and they went to the father, you know, what's the name to be? And as soon as he was saying what the name was to be, then his tongue was loosed again, and he could speak. We see all the way back in chapter 17 and verse 19, God not only told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son, but they were going to name him Yitzhak. So this is another case when God has named the son, Abraham carried out what God said. And why laughter? Some will still hold to that and say it's, it's to point out the shame of Sarah laughing when, you know, she was saying this is ridiculous. How could I, being an old woman, give joy to my old man? But I do not believe that God is naming him on a negative note. Instead, I see the Father's delight. I see the laughter, the joy, the laughter come into the home, the delight of the home, and you're going to see key why I believe that is the way of looking at the name. When I get down just a few moments, I'll be bringing you out a, a type, a picture of something greater, and that fits perfectly with that. So I think that no matter you know how impossible she thought it was and whatever her reaction was, she embraced it. Avram and Sarah did what their part was they they came together God gave them conception and it is a delight it is a joyful laughter uh, how many of us have have burst out with laughter with joyful laughter in the midst of a miraculous happening it just fits and Abraham is back on track with his God he has turned from his error and he's following through in obedience. So verse 4, then Abraham circumcised his son Yitzhak when he was eight days old. We saw circumcision that was uh, made law for them back in chapter 17, verses 10 and verse 14. That's where God established circumcision and said every male child was to be circumcised. If they were not circumcised, they would be cut off from the nation of Israel. And we even looked at why on the eighth day that medically there are reasons for it that God was instilling in uh, his people what was best for them in the physical condition also. But this circumcision that Abraham is carrying out is going to identify is the Yitzhak with the nation of Israel. This is what we would say today is a Jewish baby, <laughs> okay? Identifying with Israel. So. God, I mean, sorry, Abraham is doing what God has commanded him to do, and it even says that at the end of verse 4, that he did it as God had commanded him. Verse 5, now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Yitzhak was born to him. Here's one of the verses that tells us that. That's 25 years after he came into the land of Canaan. It's been so long since we were back in chapter 12, but chapter 12 uh, opened up with Abraham moving out of Haran and coming to the land of Canaan. Verses 4 and 5 especially tell us that, that he left Haran and he came to the land of Canaan. That was when he's finally on the move being fully obedient to God. So uh, this, again, we just see the timing. God, God's very specific here. We know the parents and we know the timing. We know it's all according to God's appointed time. It is miraculous, and it is God's hand at work. Now, there's been more said about Yitzhak before his birth than any other child apart from, and you can probably guess it, the Messiah. Apart from Yeshua's birth. No other children in Scripture is so much Scripture told about for them prior. And let me show you how Yitzhak, Isaac's birth, is a type of the Messiah's birth. When I say a type, it's a picture of. You have the type, and then you have like the fulfillment. Some call it the antitype, but it doesn't mean against. You just have the what it was a picture of, and here's the fulfillment. The same way that I've taken you through Pesach and the, the sacrificed lamb, Isaiah 53, Yeshua 53, is a picture of Yochanan saying, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world in John 1 29. And then you have Yeshua Jesus as the sacrifice, uh, 
lamb on the cross being sacrificed the same time that the lambs were being sacrificed for Passover, that picture, that would be a type and then the fulfillment. So Yitzhak's birth was the promised seed. Let's look at that real quickly. That's Genesis 17 and verse 19. Okay, come on. Oh, I'm there and I can't figure out why my tablet won't work. Okay, Genesis 17 and verse 19. But God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. You shall call his name Yitzhak, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. This is when Abraham asked if it could be Ishmael, and God says, no, it's going to be from Sarah, it's going to be Isaac, and it's going to be through him to your descendants forever. Now go with me to Yeshahu, Isaiah, chapter 9 and this is very familiar verse for you but we still want to look at it with this in mind Isaiah chapter 9 we're looking at verse 6 and here we have for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us the government will rest on his shoulders his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God eternal father prince of peace and even verse 7 tells us there'd be no end to his government, that he'd sit on the throne of David forever. So both were promised. The Messiah's promised to Israel, and Yitzhak was promised to Abraham and Sarah. Number two, there was a lengthy interval between the promise and the fulfillment. We've got 25 years that Abraham had to wait. When Yeshahu Isaiah gives his prophecy in chapter 9, how long was it before Messiah was born? Okay, I'll tell you. About 700 years. That's a long pause. But again, it was in God's perfect timing. Now, both mothers, Sarah and Miriam, you call her Mary, their reaction at the announcement was puzzlement and joy. We know that Sarah is laughing, it's unbelievable, but accepts it. And we know that Miriam was overwhelmed that she was the one chosen. Let's look first at Sarah, that's Genesis 18, 13. So go to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 13, where we read, And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? So we know that was her original reaction. Chapter 21 and verse 6 builds on this. Chapter 21 and verse 6. And we read there, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And again, some take this negative. I take this positive. God's brought laughter into my home. And those who come into my home and see, they're going to see how blessed I am. And they're going to laugh and joy and praise God with me. And I see that. I see the, the baby shower after Yitzhak is born. <laughs> I see them passing around the baby from mama to mama. And then you've got the young and you've got the old. And I just hear a house full of laughter and of joy. And they're watching this little one. And I see as he develops and giggles back with them the delight. That's what the Lord is saying. That's what he was bringing out. She was looking for with that laughter and delight. Now look at how Miriam responded. In, in Luke, it's recorded for us in the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, which is a continuation of the story, a very Jewish story that continues right on. Chapter 1 and verse 34, the angels just told Miriam that she's going to have this baby. She's promised to Yosef, but she's not married to him yet. She's had no relations. And so in verse 34, she says to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? She's amazed. Sarah, how can this be? I'm an old lady. <laughs> how can this be? And here's the chuckle, I think in that same way. Look at verses 46 and 47 as she absorbs the fact that she's told the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh is going to come upon her and she will be found with child. And she says, my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Uh, don't want to keep going. 
I could keep going. For he is regard the humble state of his bond slave. Behold, from this time on all generations will count me blessed. She realized and embraced fully how wonderful this was. She was overwhelmed by it, but she was excited. She rejoiced and she gave God all the glory. Amen. So both moms react very alike. Now, both of these children were named before they were born. Okay, we already saw, but we can go back to Genesis 19 and see it again with this in mind. We saw that God named him. And Genesis chapter 19 and, I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 19. Genesis 17 and verse 19. That's where it, uh, God announced it. God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not come up. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong verse. I was in 15. Sorry, my eyeballs. But God had said, no, Sarai, your wife will bear you a son. You shall call his name Yitzhak, Isaac. <coughs> so God told Abraham right away what he was to, to name him. And it happened. And then in Matthew, Mattathiah, a good Jewish boy, writing to a good Jewish audience, giving the Jewish genealogy of our Messiah and Savior, chapter 1, verse 21 of Matthew, we read there, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. So both were named before they were born, and both of them had their birth at God's appointed time. We just looked at that, so the reference for Genesis would be chapter 21 and verse 2, right where we are in our study. But to see it for Messiah, go with me to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, and we will look at verse 4. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of the time came, in other words, at the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. But it was at the specific time. We've got a precious one in our picture right now on video that is young. His birth came at the time that, that God allowed him to come, but it was unknown even then. We don't know these things, but God knows. And God said, this is the, the point in time, this is exactly according to my schedule. And we're thankful for the preciousness of these births. Both births, Yitzhak's and Messiah's, required miracles for conception. It was contrary to nature. Again, Miriam, it was virgin conceived by the Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. Sarah was, was with her husband, Abraham, but it was contrary to nature. Their bodies as good as dead, Miriam a virgin, both of them required a miraculous hand of God at work in their circumstances. And as I mentioned just a few moments ago with verse 3, their name indicates that, that each one was the, the delight of his father. We see the delight for Abraham. We see the delight for Sarah in the chapter that we're in right now. Let me take you to, since we're in Matthew, let's go to verse 12. Uh, we were in Galatians, but anyway. Go back to Matthew. <laughs> Go to Matthew chapter 12. And in Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 18. This is just one example that I'm giving you. Uh, and it's, it's a quote also from Isaiah. Um, I'll, I'll leave it with Matthew right now. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can tell you fast where it is in Isaiah. If I can... I'm looking at footnotes. I, did, I failed to write it down. I can get you where it is, but it, it, he's quoting Isaiah the prophet here. And the scripture tells us that. Somebody might be able to Google it fast for me. His verse 17 says, This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Verse 18, our key verse, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And it goes on. It tells how he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. But he's beloved. He's, he's well-pleasing to the Father. This is expressing the same thing that he was the, the delight of his Father. I hear Yeshua come up out of the waters of baptism, not for his sin, because he had no sin, but for, to go through the ceremonial um, ritual for lack of a better word as he was entering into his priestly office and the heavens opened up you heard the voice out of heaven declare this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased 
So we see that both fathers, they, he was the delight. Messiah is a delight, the beloved son, the only begotten son of the father, and Abraham, the delight that we hear even in the name Yitzhak. Okay, both Yitzhak's birth and his deliverance are a picture of Messiah's resurrection, life out of death. What am I talking about? We've got the, uh, the birth down pretty well, I think. We, both, we all realize the miraculousness of that birth. Chapter 22, we're on the heels of it, we'll be there in the near future. We're going to see that Yitzhak is almost sacrificed. It was as good as if Abraham had done it because he was carrying it out all the way through to the knife being lifted when God stopped Abraham from doing it. And then Yitzhak is restored to his father. We know that Messiah, it went all the way through. God did not stop the hand. Messiah's life was given as sacrifice and God raised him out of death and he lives the resurrected life that we too are given in him. <coughs> Look at Hebrews 11, 19. That Yitzhak is the closest picture we can get to it, it being an actual happening. It was, and it, Scripture tells us it was as good as if it had been done. That's what we're going to see in verse 19 of Hebrews uh, 11. It said, He, Abraham, considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So again, it was a picture. The picture can't be exactly perfect. It's like your shadow. Your shadow can't be exactly perfect of you. Your shadow is a good representation, but it falls short of being the actual. Yitzhak came as close as could be. There are those that, that try to say, well, Yitzhak was killed and brought back. No, we see God stopped the hand of Abraham and did not allow that. But Abraham had that faith, told his servants, we will come back to you, and Hebrews is confirming that, that he, knowing he was supposed to go sacrifice his son, had faith that even if he was to do it and did do it, God was going to raise his son from the dead because that son was the son of promise, the son that was to be the descendant to carry on down to the line of the, the coming Messiah. So Yitzhak's birth and his deliverance are a picture of Messiah's immaculate birth and then his death burial and resurrection life out of death and after this picture of resurrection that we see in chapter 22 Yitzhak will receive a bride by the, the his um, okay I'm saying awkward he <coughs> receives a bride the way he gets his bride is the unnamed servant calls out and brings a bride to him and that happens in chapter 24. For us, it's a beautiful picture of Yeshua Jesus. After his resurrection, we have the church begin, the called out assembly, which is called the Bride of Christ. That comes after that death of the burial and the resurrection. And the, the unnamed servant in chapter 24 in Bereshit is a picture of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit who is the one who brings us into saving faith, into the blood shed by Yeshua, that we can be his bride and be in his eternal home, our home with him forever. So what a beautiful picture. That's just, I mean, there's probably more, but it's just amazing to me how scripture has so much depth. It's that diamond looking at every facet, and even in just in Yitzhak's birth, what a picture of our Messiah his miraculous birth, life, death, resurrection for us. Wow. I love it. Is it delightful? Does it bring you that joyful laughter? Does it fill your home with joy? It should. And let's go back to that because in Genesis 21 and verse 6, where we left off, uh, we have Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Notice God made laughter for me. That's why I don't think God is, is going to the negative. He brought her joy. He brought her delight. He brought her laughter. Um, it, it's a wondrous fulfillment. It's a triumph. It's a delight. It's a joy. 
and I failed to read for you Hebrews 11, 11 when we were there. I can read it for you because I still have a tab open to it. Hebrews 11, 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Sarah said, I'm dead, but my God can do it. And then here's the proof, and she was full of the joy of the Lord as she shared the delight, her son Yitzhak, laughter with those around her. And it's a testimony to her and to us to this very day. This is God's triumph over the flesh, as good as death. This is God's fulfillment, God's amazing, God's amazing. I'll just say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> what what joy it should fill us with and I feel his joy right now and trust you do also so verse 7 and she said who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children yet I have given birth to a son in his old age again God's just saying it every which way and not giving any room for anyone to come up with any off-the-wall interpretations of this not only do we have that miraculous birth, but Sarah is the one who nursed Yitzhak. That means that her whole reproductive was completely restored, that she was able to uh, nurse him, she was able to take care of him as the mother of this child. It wasn't surrogate, it wasn't someone else stepping in, and uh, it, it, it just shows God does every detail, the whole picture. And again, um, it should have been very easy to believe in virgin birth when you look at the God who brought Sarah life out of her dead body and her husband's dead body. And when you go further back to what we already recall and remember every Shabbat, the God who created out of nothing. Is there anything too hard for God? And isn't that what he asked when Sarah left? You know, to Abraham, is there anything too hard for God? And so I will encourage you today, is there anything too hard for God? That's why when we worry, when we have those moments, how displeasing and disappointing it must be to our God, who has never given us the right or reason to think anything short of his taking care of every detail of whatever we need. Anyone got something impossible? Because I hear my God say, with God, all things are possible. That's Matthew 19. Okay, on that note, praising our God, filled with his joy and his laughter, we have the child growing. Verse 8, the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham held a great feast on the day that Yitzhak was weaned. That was the custom of the day. When the baby was finally able to be self, well, not self-sufficient totally, but didn't need mama's milk, the baby's developed now. It's called being weaned. And probably he was between two and three years of age. That was the custom at that time. It's very practical and very likely from the rest of the things that we'll know from Scripture that that's about how old he was. And it was a day when they would have a great feast and a great rejoicing. I see our Orthodox Jewish people in their traditions today, the son does not have his first haircut till he's three. And when he turns three and gets that haircut, it's a big deal. He is now a male child. <laughs> not that he wasn't male before that, but it's a celebration. You know, he's on his way. You know, he's, he's uh, sustaining life. So it just fits. It was a joyful time, I can imagine. He, Abraham's 103. You know, we know that, that they gave birth many, many years younger than that because we see it from all the genealogy. So how many years did he think, I'll never have that joyful celebration? And here it was. I have a feeling he did it up big. <laughs> so all is good, right? Happiness in the household. Life is, how does the fairy tale go? And they, they lived happily ever after? That's it, right? Y'all set for that? We can close the book, right? And you're saying, okay, Rochelle. When you talk like that, I know you're pulling my leg. Because sadly, verse 9. 
Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking Yitzhak, mocking Isaac, laughing at him, making a sport of him, jesting at him. This is Ishmael. They, these two kids are half-brothers, uh, and this is Ishmael in his true character, really. He's, he's scorning him. He's laughing him to derision. He's scoffing at him. Look with me at Galatians 4. This was not just a little bit of teasing. This was not something to be just taken lightly. And, you know, uh, the old saying, which isn't true, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you, which we all know is anything but true. But this was more than just a little bit of sibling discomfort here. Galatians 4, verses 29 and 30 said, says, but as at that time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Okay, so here we, we have that this was persecution. At the time, the one that was born according to the flesh, thus Ishmael, when Abraham stepped into his flesh and took Hagar and got her pregnant and then that one is persecuting the one who we just talked about that it was by the Spirit of God uh, rejuvenating the bodies of Abraham and Sarah that they were able to give birth to Isaac so <clears throat> this is persecution this is scorning it, it's taken to a, a larger a higher level and even today we see Ishmael and his descendants that persecuted Isaac and his descendants. So again, what we're seeing is in the flesh, human strength, human wisdom, human desires, persecuting, and as Galatians brings it in, the flesh versus the spirit. So it's persecuting those who are following God, those who are trying to walk by faith, those who are standing according to the promises. And in that, I can take it down to the battle between the saved and the unsaved, between the, the world who persecutes the Christian for his faith. So what we see an example here that initially begins with the descendants, the sibling rivalry within the families. We know that Ishmael gives the birth, in essence, to the Arab nations that are persecuting the Jewish nation Israel to this day. But we can also take it into the spiritual realm and see the flesh versus the spirit and see it there too, uh, sadly. Sadly, but it's not just a light little teasing that's going on. This is uh, causing there to be such consternation in life that something has to happen. There has to be a change. Sarai, the, the mama watching her son be, I don't, tortured is what came to mind, but I don't mean, you know, he's not being burned at the stake, excuse me, but he is, is suffering this constant, constant ad camp. She's going to stand up to, uh, for his defense. And in verse 10, therefore, she said to Abraham, drive out this slave woman and her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be an heir with my son Yitzhak. Okay, Sarah's, Sarah's had it. She is saying, this one is not going to inherit the promises of this one. This one is a thorn in the flesh. This one is causing problem for my son who is to receive all the inheritance. So my son isn't going anywhere. Out. That one needs to get out. And that's just, she really, she would had all that she could handle at this point. Now again, spiritually, we're going to see that Ishmael represents the law and the flesh. Isaac represents grace and the spiritual. And those two cannot dwell in harmony. You can't mix the law and grace. You can't go back and forth between this, these two. And Ishmael showing that law, showing that doing it in the flesh is um, superseded by Yitzhak, who is by grace through the ability that, that God has given him and that one is the one who'll be heir to all that God has promised. So we, we see a total separation. Let me take you back in the book of Galatians. I think it's important for us to see this in detail because there's argument on this to this day. When we talk about the separation, when we talk about not being under law and being under grace, 
We're not saying that God says, there's no law, do whatever you want, throw all care to the wind, you can murder, you can covet, you can do this, you can do that. No, but we are seeing that it's God's grace. Through his grace that we're brought into his family and we become joint heirs with Yeshua Jesus so that that is our future and the law has no place in that. So Ishmael representing the law has no place in that promise. Galatians 4, starting with verse 21. So, uh, and Paul's talking to people who have been raised under law, were keeping the law, they were the, the Judaizers of the day that were saying, you can't quit the law, you've got to keep the law. They weren't totally walking away from Yeshua, but they were adding it in. And if you add in anything along with Yeshua, Jesus, you're wrong. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus, period. Okay, so this is an argument that's taking place, and, and Shaul Paul says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abram had two sons, one by the bondwoman, Hagar, one by the free woman, Sarah. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. They did it all themselves. The son by the free woman, Sarah, through the promise. Sarah was pregnant, had Isaac, because God promised. This is allegorically speaking. So Paul's telling you, this is an allegory. This is a picture for you. For these women are the two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, the law, because Moses got the law at Mount Sinai, is bearing children who are slaves. They're slaves to the law. She's Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, which that's the earthly Jerusalem under that law. She's a slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above, that would be the heavenly Jerusalem, that's free. She's our mother because it's written, Rejoice, barren women who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. The free is the one who is going to, to win the victory. The free is the one who will receive the heir, who will have the, the children of promise. Verse 28, And you, brethren, like Yitzhak, your children of promise. But as at that time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him at the time, Ishmael persecuted Isaac, who was born according to the Spirit. So it's also now. But what does the scripture say? And I read it for you a moment ago. Cast out that bondwoman. Cast out that law. Cast out the slavery. And the, the, what goes with that law? For the son of the bondwoman is not an heir with the son of the free woman. In other words, the law, and those of you who are under the law, are children of the law that will never give you your heavenly father. So you have no heir. You, you have no future in that law. The law speaks death. But in grace, coming into the promises of God, by the Spirit of God, you come into life eternal. You come into the promises. You come into the heavenly Jerusalem, and you come into all the promises that God has for you. So verse 31, Then, brethren, we're not children of Hagar, of the bondwoman, but we're children of Sarah, the free woman. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. We are adopted into God's family. We are, are brought in through faith. We are brought in through the the atoning work of Yeshua Jesus, period. Not through Jesus and earning it. Remember, even with Abraham, we saw the last chapter he fails miserably. The next chapter he's receiving his promise because God is faithful. Now, there is enough indication from the Hebrew to believe in this that Sarah may have even been concerned that one day Ishmael was going to kill Yitzhak. It could have been that she thought it'll happen unintentionally, it'll happen in a fit of anger, a fit of rage. It could have been that she thought he would premeditate. I don't know. One day we can ask her. <laughs> but the Hebrew does give indication it was that serious. That's why it's not just one sibling poking fun at another. I won't tell on who, but in my family, I remember in the generation that comes under us, the, the brother teasing the sister, 
basically that like that commercial, you know, running all through the house with his finger just inches from her her shoulder, saying, oh, "I'm not touching you, oh, I'm not touching you," and just pushing the the little girl to almost tears, just in relentless teasing. That's not good. That's not acceptable. And he did get in trouble for that. But that's not what we're talking about. This was a greater level than that. If there was even a fear that that uh, Isaac's life could be taken by Sarah, who, who should trust the Lord. The Lord was not going to let that happen. But we can understand why she's in her, she, she's finally was fed up, it's enough, get, get her out, get her out. This is just it. No, you know, no compromise, no room to live together. No, you go to your corner, you go to your corner. She's telling all around, done with, get out. Okay? Now, what we see happen in the driving out of this um, slave woman, we have to look at the culture and the context of the time also. So let me read to you verses 11 and 12, and then let me tell you a little bit of what we know from what we have uh, found in, in historical records. Um, verse 10, Sarah tells Abraham, get her out. Verse 11, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son Ishmael. That's still his son, and he's he is troubling him greatly. Verse 12, that God said to Abraham, God was aware, God was involved, they're listening to God in the midst of this, and that needs to be remembered. Do not be distressed because of the boy and your slave woman. Notice what he calls Hagar. She's your slave. He didn't call her your wife. She was not his wife. She was his slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Yitzhak, Isaac, your descendants shall be named. So God had a choice in it. His choice was going to be protected. His choice was Yitzhak, and he was telling Avraham, do whatever Sarah is saying to do, because your son, Yitzhak, is the one that matters. This is the where the descendants are going to come, etc., etc. Now, these tablets that have been found that give us um, through archaeology, give us evidence of what life was like back in Bible times, you know, back, way, way back, okay? They tell us of the customs of the Horites. Let me ask Rhonda's question before I explain because I'm going to get an explanation. So go ahead, Rhonda. I'm going to interrupt myself. Can you help Rhonda <laughs> unmute? Yeah. We're working on it. Corner, 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 go over one. There you go. Okay, try again. There you are. I just back on what you were talking about just before you switched gears. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to get clarification because I'm studying something. So when a, all the people after Abraham, when they died, they went into Abraham's book, right? Okay, yes. When Christ came and they're with, they're in heaven, right? So those people that died before Christ, the Israel, the Israelites is what I'm talking about, they went to Abraham's bosom because of faith, because the, the Israelites were under the law. So if they didn't keep the law, but they had faith in the coming Messiah, did they go to heaven regardless of whether they kept the law? In essence, what you're saying, I'm going to say yes. Let me explain just a little bit, especially for those who may not have the background you have right now. When we use the word Abraham's bosom, when, when people died prior to the cross, they would go into Sha'ol, into the heart of the earth. There were two compartments. There was the paradise called Abraham, Abraham's bosom, there was the place of suffering. We see in Luke, oh goodness, I'll get you the chapter. I should know this. I'm hoping it'll come back to my mind. In Luke, Yeshua, Jesus gives a parable, but he gives really he gives a story because anytime he used real names, it was a real story. And we're told of the person called Lazarus who went to his death he was being comforted in Abraham's bosom. The rich man had, could see Lazarus comforted. 
and he was in torture and asked for Lazarus to come dip his finger in some water and put it on his tongue that he might have just that tiny bit of comfort in his place of suffering. And he was told there's a great gulf, a cavern in between these two places that no one can cross. From this we understand that Sha'ol, the name given in Hebrew, it was the holding tank for people who died before the cross. I'll tell you why the difference at the cross in a moment. But again, you had the suffering and you had the, the comforting side. Which would you go into? Every single person deserved the suffering side. No one kept the law perfectly. If you did not keep the law perfectly, the punishment was death. The punishment would be to go into eternal suffering. The consequences, the wages of sin is death. But... For those who believed in the coming sacrifice of Yeshua, they made those animal sacrifices. They made them on a regular basis. They made a sin sacrifice. They made other sacrifices. And they were not believing that that animal that died in their place was their savior. But they were declaring that animal is a picture of the coming one who will save me from death. So those who had faith in God's coming promise would be who we call believers, and they would be the ones who went into the paradise side. Those who stayed opposed to God never accepted God's plan as they could foresee it, died in their sin. They died with no forgiveness, no covering, and so they would go into the suffering side. When we get to the cross, Yeshua went into the heart of the earth for three days. Now, hear me loud and clear, please, because I'll get on my soapbox. Yeshua, Jesus, did not go to hell. No one goes to hell and comes back out. He did not go to hell. He did not go and suffer for three days in the flames of eternal fire and then come out of it. He said on the cross, it is finished. And when he gave up his spirit, he gave his spirit up to God. He went into the paradise side. He told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Here's your example also. This thief obviously hadn't been keeping the law. He's on the cross. He can't do anything. He can't make a sin sacrifice. He can't do anything. But he knew from the testimony of Yeshua and the way he was accepting his death and what was being said around him, he knew this one doesn't deserve death. This one, there's something different about this one. And he pleads to him for help for his own soul. And Yeshua, Jesus says, yes, today you'll be with me in paradise. Those two, Yeshua and the thief on the cross, went into the, the uh, Abraham's bosom, into the paradise side. When you look at the picture of Jonah, Jonah, it said that in Matthew 5, it says that, that Yeshua would be in the heart of the earth the way that Yonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then Yonah got spit out. Yeshua gets resurrected. What happened in that time, Yeshua resurrects from the grave. He sees Miriam at the grave. She is so beside herself. She's crying so heavily that she doesn't even recognize who it is. She thinks it's a gardener. She thinks that the body of Yeshua has been stolen because she can see the grave is empty, and she's just beside herself in her grief. When this one who was not the gardener lets her know, calls her by name, and she suddenly realizes and cries out, Master, she realizes it's resurrected Yeshua. She wants to do what I want to do. Throw your arms around this one that you thought was dead and gone that you love. She wanted to just smother him with her love. And he told her, stop clinging to me. I've not yet ascended unto my father. Go and tell the others. Now, a little bit later, we see some other women that see Yeshua, and they're not told, quit clinging to me. They're allowed to cling to him. We know that as you move on down through time, Thomas is told, touch Put your hand on my side. See the, the nail piercings. Feel me. Know that I'm real. I'm not a spirit. So obviously something had happened in between the don't cling and the allowing the touch. And Yeshua himself said that he hadn't yet gone to his father. What he hadn't done yet was miraculously take his blood. And I say miraculously because it was spilled on the ground. It poured out of him. 
We know when the spear went into his side, uh, blood and water came out. But miraculously, Yeshua was able to take his blood, go to heaven, to where the real mercy seat is, put his blood on the heavenly mercy seat. That's what opened the way into heaven. Without that blood on the heavenly mercy seat, we could not, no one could, Abraham could, all of the people who had died before could not go into heaven because until Yeshua's blood was there to wash away their sin, their sins were only being covered by the belief in. Now the reality took place. The blood was there, the way into heaven is open. And that's why scriptures tell us that through the flesh, through his, his body being broken, that the way into heaven was made open. It was his body sacrifice on the cross that opened heaven up, that allowed there to be an opening now into heaven where now believers can go right into the presence of the Lord. They don't have to go into the heart of the earth and wait for this to take place. It has taken place. It was finished at the cross we look back and by faith are translated into heaven at the moment that we leave this body. And that's why Shaul Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Without going into it right now, there's some verses in Galatians also that talk about that the Lord led captivity captive. He led this triumphal process where we believe that, that he took the paradise side of Shaul and he placed it into heaven. Whether it was all of it or part of it, we don't know. But he, he, in essence, took through the realm, the principalities of the power of the air, which is Satan's domain, he took those straight through and into heaven safely. Where we know now, we go through Satan's atmosphere, we go through where his henchmen are working safely, and we are immediately in the presence of the Lord and there we are forever when we leave this earth when we leave our physical being so there is the total change before the cross before the blood was put on the mercy seat in heaven no one could go into heaven because sins were were covered but now sins are washed away in the blood completely washed away now we're clothed in his robe of righteousness and we're even going to talk about that not today but probably next week in our class we're going to see another picture there how that robe of righteousness comes on to us and we are seen in that standing so God looks at us and says I see you as saved you will go into his presence the moment you leave this earth if you are not a believer God does not see you as saved and you will still go down into that holding tank. That holding tank, that suffering side, is still there. It will not be taken out until all the way past tribulation, millennium, the, the battle that uh, Satan tries to come against Yeshua at the end of the millennium. All of that's been done and taken care of. And then there is what is called the great white throne judgment. That is not the believer's judgment. And I'll get on my soapbox there too. That is not the Bema Seed of Christ. It has two totally different names. It's two totally different times and it's two totally different pictures. We never stand before God to have our sins judged. Hallelujah. They're under the blood. They're washed away. We'll stand before God for judgment of reward or loss of reward. That's what happens at the Bema Seat. But at the great white throne judgment, the books are opened. The books of life are opened to show that these names of these people standing at the great white throne judgment are not in the book of life. Their names have been blotted out when they made that final rejection of their Savior. They did not want the Savior's blood to forgive them for their sins, and so they died in those sins and the consequence will be to stand before God at the great white throne for their judgment for all of eternity. So one like Hitler, who's got sins galore, who's, who was evil personified, is going to suffer consequences equal to that suffering that, that he caused. Where someone who lived a good life, was a good neighbor and a good friend, but never loved our Lord, denied him 
said, oh, I'm good enough. I don't need that. I don't accept that. They're going to still suffer for all of eternity. They're going to be separated from the love of God. They're going to be separated from peace and from joy and from being in the presence of the Lord. They didn't want the Lord, so he's not forcing himself on them. They will suffer their consequence also. But in some way, there will be a, a, a justness to a Hitler getting a worse than a nice little person. So that's a great white throne. That's when that tank of suffering is removed from the heart of the earth. Then we go on into new heavens and a new earth. Do we wonder why? This is all tainted with sin. It's all got to be changed. It's all got to be glorifying the Lord because the beautiful, beautiful birds for our heaven, for our eternity, never a sin will enter in. Never a lie will enter in. Never will there be a history repeats itself. Hallelujah. Yes, Dora? Is that after the 1,000 years? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's almost to the end of what we know. And I'll call it like I did that song last week that I told you about. It's the end of the beginning. <laughs> because we, I has not seen or ear heard what God has. And the scroll that we have that gives us our plan of the ages is at the end of that scroll. That's, that'll be rolled up. God even says he rolls up the heavens like a scroll. And I believe he's going to throw out a new map. He's going to throw out a new scroll. And who knows what, where we're going to soar with all of that. Ah, I'm dying to know. Literally, I'm dying to know. <laughs> or I might get raptured and not die to know, but, but in essence, the body will die. So does that fully answer your question, Rhonda? You're, she got muted again. Can you unmute her? Oh, she gave me a heart. I think that means she's good. <laughs> okay. Um, and I don't remember what shot us off of that. I know it wasn't a slight sidetrack, but I felt like it was important. That's why I chose to go ahead and answer it um, before it brought us back into what I was going into now. So um, I hope that you all agree. I just feel sometimes it's very important. We're not here to hurry through Genesis. We're here to understand the Word of God and to see that whole picture. There's so much that I hear out there especially, and it is a pet peeve of mine, and just coming through the time when we talk about his um, death, burial, and resurrection, you hear it more often. And I hear people that I, I respect, you know, I'm not saying don't listen to them because they say one thing different than me. No, 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 no. We're, you know, all of us are imperfect. But when I hear them say that Jesus went to hell, it just makes me cringe. It, it just, you know, that's where the idea of purgatory comes from. You gotta, you gotta go through this suffering. You got, you know, you. It's not enough that Jesus died, and I just, I just gotta tell you, no, 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 no. He did it all, and he went into paradise by his own words. Yeah, but why do they say he went in, in, in the middle of the earth and took the keys, or, or um, overcame death or whatever? It talks about taking the keys of Hades. That's in Revelation chapter 9, and that is showing when the key is who has the control. And it's showing that even one of the Lord's angels is more powerful than Satan and has the keys to bind him in the bottomless pit during the millennium until he is led out to do his last dastardly deed through the face of the earth, come up in the face of God, and he get cast into eternal hell Eternal means forever. I'm repeating myself. <laughs> Eternal hell forever is, you know, I shouldn't say it that way, but I will because I want to emphasize that it's forever. So, um, so it, it's it's there is a binding, there is a time, but when we see the picture rolled out according to scripture, we see it in line. Okay. Well, is the it, wheels are turning. <laughs> is it how some people say it? Because I understand God was the one, not the angel, but Jesus is the one that took the keys and defeated death. And okay, I have to see the scripture they're saying because there are so many thoughts that are running in my mind, different uh, aspects yeah. that people bring out. So bring to me exactly where you're, you're, what you're hearing, or I'll try to find it and say, is this what you're meaning? But if, if they're saying that, at the moment of his resurrection, at the moment of his death, really. Mm -hmm. Death was that he paid the penalty. Resurrection shows it was accepted by God and gives us that power of abundant life that we live now and forever. 
So I'm going to say it, his death. That would be when he took the, the key, the power that Satan has, what is defeated forever. But it really isn't Satan's because Satan doesn't give life and death. So I think it's a matter of how they're phrasing it and looking at it. But uh, that could be the only time I could say that he t snatched the key. I think Satan thought he had a victory for th those three days that the Lord's body was in the grave. I think you know the havoc he wreaked on the face of the earth and all that was going on. I think he thought, you know, look at me, you know, but the final was not there. The final was the resurrection. And but God the Father is the one that brought him out of. Yes, yes, because the body, you know, the the shell part, mm -hmm. is um, what died. God doesn't die. Yeah. The shell, the human. Part mm -hmm. is what died, and yes, it, it, God is the one who, in essence, resurrected the Son, mm -hmm. because we you have to see it in that way. You know, He's three to Himself, but yet He's three at one. That's uh, how do we how do we say it yeah. and say it right? It's like, even though His body's been resurrected. His spirit was already in heaven, right? His spirit, His spirit was in the heart of the earth, right. in paradise. Right. Then his spirit was given a resurrected body, which we also will have. When we live in the resurrection, we're not going to have flesh and blood and bone. We're going to have flesh and bone. We're still going to be seen. We're still going to be touched. But the life of this flesh is in the blood. That got drained out. Yeshua, when he appeared to them after his resurrection, he said, I'm flesh and bone. Feel me and see. He didn't say I'm flesh and blood and bone. His blood was spent. But the resurrected body is not dependent on the blood for life. We are. That's why George Washington died. They leached him of his blood because they thought they were doing him a favor. They were hastening his death because they were taking the blood away from him. But that's our human life on this side. Our eternal life will be flesh and bone. We're, we're not just going to be woo-hoo spirits. That's why we're told that the dead in Christ rise first. They're given, you know, and this is split seconds, not even split seconds, but that they put on immortality. They're given their immortal body that will go on forever. We also are changed immediately from mortality into immortality. But uh, we go on in a form that can be seen and touched and felt. Yeshua, Jesus... Is going to be seen through all of eternity. When we talk about God and we see pictures of God, the Ancient of Days in Daniel 9, the wool, white wool hair, the eyes of fire, the, the hand in Revelation 5, the hand that has the scroll that hands it to the Lamb, we get personified God. But God isn't confined to that body. It, it has spoken to us in a way so we can relate, see, and understand. But we don't really know what God looks like. What we know is what Yeshua Jesus looks like. When you've seen him, you've seen the Father, but not on an earthly level that we can't understand. But we're going to see Yeshua through all of eternity in the way that he was when he was on this earth. <clears throat> When the, the over 500 saw him after his resurrection, not one of them said, who is that? Every single one knew. Remember even Miriam <clears throat> knew in the garden, that's my master. The women knew it was the risen Lord. Thomas fell on his feet and be, you know, bowed before him, my, my Lord, my God, my Father, my God. I forget how he says it. But he acknowledges who he was. He just couldn't wrap his mind around it being true till he saw it for himself. But when he saw the Lord, he knew. We're going to know, even though we didn't walk this earth with the Lord, we're going to know that's the Lord. We're going to see nail piercings that will remind us through all of eternity what he suffered for us, the great cost of our salvation. When we see those nail prints, mm -hmm. I guarantee you, you're going to fall on your face before him and just... Just cry out your thanksgiving. How could you not? To hear it is one thing. To see it is another mm -hmm. thing. But everyone is going to know who he is. See him in that, I'll call it bodily form, through all of eternity. Because that's what Yeshua chose to do. The Son chose to put on 
a face that we're going to relate to forever. That's amazing. That's amazing grace. That's, oh my God, what you did for me. You know, you, 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 you took the ocean and you put it in a teacup for me. Wow. Wow. And you did it, you were willing to do it knowing that you were choosing to do it forever. That, I, I can't wrap my mind around it. I, I cannot fully express it. Wow. Wow. And like you were saying a while back too, that once we get to heaven, um, everybody will know us as we were known. And we're going to know more, not yeah. less. Those of you uh, that question arises, will we know each other in heaven? Hello. Why would you know less when you get home than you know now? You're going to be in your perfected state. I guarantee you, they're not up there with name tags. Let me introduce you. I'm Paul. Let me, let me introduce you. I'm Elijah. Oh, but I'm Elisha. You know, well, let me read your name tag. I guarantee you, that's human, that's earth. We're going to know. It says that we're going to be known as we know. You know, it, no. I, I, I'm sorry, it's so personal, so close, and so upfront right now with my beloved Anne going to heaven. And I, I will tell you, the tears still fall, and every time they do, I stop myself from dwelling on my loss, mm -hmm. and I start thinking about Anne. Who is she talking to? Who is she seeing? What she's doing, I see her running all over heaven. She couldn't run in her last day. She couldn't walk. I see her free. I see, you talk about delight with Yitzhak. You talk about the joy in the home. Oh, hello. I can hear her with the heavenly choirs praising God. She loved to sing here on earth. Her health compromised that. I see her singing like she never sung before. I see her meeting all of these people. She's met Abraham. She's met Sarah. She's met Yitzhak. She's got all the answers. We've got all the questions. That's not fair. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's not. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I've been able to give that witness so many times dealing with her affairs right now. Even this morning, and I pray for these hearts right now, I quickly can ascertain who on the other end of the phone is a believer and who is not by how they respond to me. Some of them absolutely have no clue what to do with me when I start talking about the fact that I am comforted knowing she is alive, she is pain-free, and she is with her Savior who died to save her and who lived to keep her. It's like total... Uh, or it's... Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to know? I mean, you, you know very quickly. And in the midst of that has been both Jewish and Gentile. So please keep praying for that testimony to touch these lives that need to be touched by it. I think one of the things that's got to shake people the most is when we have such confidence in death. It, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It is not there. And pray for us because next Tuesday, and I'm glad I thought it because we didn't put it down in prayer. Next Tuesday, we are going to be at the graveside for the flesh, for the body of Anne in a Jewish cemetery doing a messianic service. Mm -hmm. God pulled that off. In 2007, when her husband Steve went home, I have full confidence God's going to pull it off again. Only God can do that. It's a miraculous story how it happened in 2007. But even here, may God be glorified. May people have eyes opened. May they have ears to hear. And may it be the, the day of their salvation. That's why the Lord even takes us home early, is for the work to be accomplished. So... I'm off, but we're past time. That's why I, I let it go off. I realize I'll, I'll come back to the customs of the day back in Abraham's day where we'll understand a little more about how this being sent off will happen because we all know Hagar and Ishmael go off. What was that? Was that a vindictive mother or was that the hand of God? What about these customs, why it was done the way it was done, who's calling the shots? I mean, there's a lot of questions in here you got to wait two weeks to pick up because, forgive me, but there will be no class on April 26th. So when we come back May 3rd, for the day right ahead of day of prayer, mark your calendars for that. We'll go into all of this. If you can't wait, let me know. I'll answer you. <laughs> but uh, 
we might get raptured before and you'll have all the answers too. And if not, I will look forward to seeing you again. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, I will close us in prayer, but then open the mics so that we can still can continue talking. But uh, I just, what, what a God, what a plan. Wow. Here comes my adult vocabulary, everybody. Mm. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't see any hands or questions. Let's close in prayer and then open it for the mics and those who need to leave can. Oh, my God. And I say that 100% reverential, respectful. Oh, my. Elohim Hai most high God. You are so amazing, so awe-inspiring, so loving. The plan that you have made for us, the love that loved us when we were yet sinners, the grace that keeps us, the fact that you made it 100% on you and all we have to do is freely accept, and the fact that we can know so that I can rejoice that another one of my loved ones is in heaven with you and one day I will be there also. Oh, Lord, thank you. You are amazing, and we could go on with all of your names and all of your attributes. We could say it until, until we're eternally with you, and it would not be long enough to praise you, to thank you, to see the magnanimous plan for man, the magnanimous care and love. Oh, what a Savior. How we praise you, how we Thank you. Lord, let us do all we can now to show you that appreciation. Let us serve you while the day is still day. Let us do what we can. And, oh, Lord, use us to be billboards for you. Use us to be shining <coughs> lights in the darkness. Use us to be the beacon that draws one more to you, one more to heaven. And may it even be so in Anne's home going and with this, this uh, memorial service next week. Let it be with those we're talking with in between, however and everywhere, Lord. Byways and highways, to the mountaintops and to the valleys, to the lowest point on earth and to the highest, to the richest home and to the poorest home. Thank you that your salvation is the free gift to all mankind, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, free and enslaved. It matters not. You free us all. We know the truth and we are set free. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I can't wait to be home with you. Praise you and thank you for that sure word. Thank you for blessing us so. Not just saving us, but keeping us and taking us home. In Jesus' precious name, Yeshua. Amen. 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 Don't you just love him? <laughs> oh, I need a bigger vocabulary, Lord. You are ineffable and indescribable, but I still need a bigger vocabulary. Open the mics, Roger. Let it out.